local history, local culture, local events, your community. This is the Joe Kelly Show. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Frank Tomeno is our guest. And whenever Frank comes in, we talk local history. Frank has been writing about history for the Observer Dispatch for many a year. He's been down at the Observer Dispatch for seven decades, starting eight decades. Going on the eighth decade, 1958. Wow. Uh, And whenever Frank Frank continues to write his uh, history column for the OD, former city editor, uh, local historian, and very active at the United County History Center. Uh, We're going to talk about today, Frank, uh, Loom to Boom. And uh, Loom to Boom, what years would that have been? Well, really, I would say uh, uh, right after World War II, 1947, 6, 7, to 1955, 56. I remember the end of it the yeah. loom to boom era and uh, uh that was a time when uh, the city was going 24 7 with factory jobs uh, chicago pneumatic and bendix and kelsey GE. ge with uh four plants i think uh, yeah. uh going uh and it it all came about uh, uh from a strategic kind of a plan correct no, it, it, we were just fortunate we had at that time a group of men, there were no women in this group, that uh, met just about every afternoon for lunch at the Ford Schuyler Club. And they were concerned, a couple of things. The, the, the knitting mills were beginning to leave Utica. There's the loom There's part. There's the loom, yeah. And um, I hate to say it, but leaving kind of an uneducated workforce behind. You know, uh, members of my family, my mother and father, you know, went up to eighth grade and worked in the mills, like many, many families. And, uh, uh, and they were concerned, they wanted more diversity. They said, for too many years, we've defend- de- depended on textiles. So this group got together and came up with a plan. And I'm, I'm talking about people like John Train, who was a pre- wasn't uh, president of Utica Mutual. Yeah. Richard Balsh, head of uh, Utica, uh, Horrocks Sibbetson, big Democrat, big Republican. Um, uh, uh, Henry Dorrance, an attorney, uh, you start naming them, the president of International Heater. Um, there were just so many. And um, they came up with a plan. Um, and while they were doing this, they got word. Both They had connections in Washington and in Albany. Richard Balch was state Democratic chairman. John Train was a close friend of Republicans in Albany. And they got wind that Chicago Dometic, a company that had a plant in Cleveland, was looking to build a big plant in the Northeast. And they went to work. Uh, I mean, first of all, they sent the people to Cleveland. And New York City was the, the Chicago Dometic main office. They sent people there. What do you need? What do you, um, what will this new plant make? What do you need? What can we give you? And, uh, and this plant was interested in, um, first of all, they, they didn't want, uh, a lot of communities were interested in getting the Chicago Dramatic plant, not only in, New, in uh, New York, but in New England, you know, they had heard about it. So they were wondering, how did this Utica group heard about it? Well, John Train, who had friends in Albany, had heard about it, and that started the ball rolling. And they found out what, uh, what the concerns were, labor management relations, the quality of water, the availability of water, the, gr- the land itself, uh, fire protection, and to make a long story short, so they put a, a booklet together, and they presented it to the uh, president of uh, Chicago to I'm talking now 1946, 1947. They overwhelmed the the, uh, the Chicago Dramatic people. Was there somebody that went down there beside the booklet, Frank? Was there yeah, somebody that went Vincent down there? Carew. Okay. Uh, this group, there was a, the Chamber of Commerce, develop uh, uh, had a um, industrial development division, and Vincent Carew who had been mayor of Utica in the '30s, graduate of Fordham University, bright man. He was 
president of this division. They sent him down there. And I guess there were a couple of others, but he was the leader. And he talked, and later we found out that uh, the president of Chicago to Madigan was overwhelmed. Every question he had, they had the answer. How much nitrogen in the soil? They knew about it, that type of thing. And the land they had picked was um, 77 acres in West Frankfurt, just east of the Utica city line on the Bleecker Street extension, just east of Masonic. Did that create some problems, Frank, that the fact that uh, you were not exactly in Utica, you were no, because first of all, there was a lot of cooperation from the legislators in, in Herkimer, so there was no problem there. The one problem that they did sell, Chicago Nomadic said, well, if we build a $3 million plant in West Frankfurt, you know, although we love volunteer fire departments, we can't depend on a volunteer fire department a couple of miles away to, Utica said, we'll, we'll, um, We'll provide fire protection. We'll provide police protection. This is where the Ruffy Elephants and the Charlie Donnellys, the politicians, came in. Richard Bolsch, who was, again, president of Hork Gibson, state Democratic chairman. Hork Gibson, for those who don't know that name, uh, uh, world-famous fishing company. Fishing, fishing tackle, yeah. the world's biggest on uh, Whitefoot Street. And later, the, the, uh, or before that, the Saturday Globe newspaper. And... Uh, uh, so Balsh said that... Uh, so Balsh said uh, he was one of the men that met every noon at lunch with, these, with this group at Fort Schuyler Club. But he said every so often he would stop at Marino's. Marino's was a little restaurant yeah. on Canton Street, which was Little City Hall. Uh, the Democrats, Ruffy Elephant, Charlie Donnelly, and union leaders, Joe Davoli, that's where they had lunch. Bosch would go there and he said, he said, I always found it romantic. <laughs> but he said, uh, we needed their cooperation too. We needed union help. We needed, everybody worked together. Uh, Utica would put in the sewer lines. Um, and the reason I know a lot of this, well, I interviewed Boyd Golder, who was mayor of Utica during this time. When he was in his 80s, and I was writing my column, frankly speaking, I interviewed him, I spent three days with him, and he told me great stories, and the story about Chicago to Medic. And the reason we know a lot of this, too, at the groundbreaking, uh, which was at, it's really the site of the old Utica Park. I want to talk to you about that in a second. Right. And uh, at Utica Park had a baseball diamond, and the home plate had never been taken out. It was still embedded in the ground. And that's where the groundbreaking took place. And the son of the president of Chicago Nomadic was the main speaker. And he's the one that told the story, how they were overwhelmed. And, and then this group continued. You know, they brought in Bendix Aviation. They brought in, G GE already had a little tube factory on 10th Street, but they brought in GE on French Road. Yeah. Um, when yeah. we come back, yeah. uh, you've opened up a whole lot of questions, yeah. uh, including who is responsible for that saying, loom to boom. That went down in the history books. When we come back, we'll okay. talk to, yeah. to that uh, question. Frank Tomato's our guest. We're talking loom to boom, a great era in Utica's history. Short break, right back. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. Frank Tomano is our guest. Frank, longtime columnist at the Observer Dispatch. He continues to write his history column. Uh, we're talking about Loom to Boom, a great era in Utica's uh, past. Uh, loom to Boom, that phrase, Frank, you, you read the history books, you see it throughout the written history. Uh, who coined that phrase? Well, 
you're never going to find it in a history book because, but. Um, I you became, mean who coined the phrase? Yeah, I, I became pretty close friends with Dr. Chris Cifulli, who was uh, the head of the economics department at Utica College. And every so often we would have dinner, we, we enjoyed, and he would talk about this era, and I would talk about growing up in Utica in the 30s, he was interested. Anyway, he's the one that told me that uh, the phrase Carl Spitzer, who was, I believe, PR man for Bendix Aviation, came up with the uh, title, Loom the Boom, and it stuck. Was he, uh, that name Spitzer rings a bell with me somehow, Frank, in the back of my mind. Was he involved with the Utica Chamber of Commerce? I think he was, yeah. yeah. I'm not, uh, I, 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 uh, I checked the, f I don't know what happened to his file at the OD. We just don't have it there anymore. Uh, but yeah, he was involved with the chamber too. The, uh, uh, you mentioned that on the site, of where Chicago Pneumatic would be built, uh, it was a park. Yeah, Two old, parks, old, right? The old Utica Park, yeah. Yeah, and then it became Forest Park? Then it became Forest Park. Talk okay. about Utica Park, what was there? Well, Utica Park, um, in the late 1890s, the, 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 the trolley company in Utica, which was huge, the trolley company at that time had about 200 trolley cars, 130 miles of track in Utica, and they were um, carrying about 28 million passengers a year. Mm. I mean, it was a busy, and they got the idea to, um, to increase the trolley traffic. Why not build two amusement parks? One on the eastern end, Utica Park on the Bleecker Street extension, just east of Masonic Home. And on the western end, in Oriskany, Summit Park. Yeah. Both built by the trolley company. You took the trolley, they had trolley stations at each place. You, um, uh, if you bought your ticket on the trolley, it also, uh, 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 you could get into the park. It was the entrance fee into the park. And this was a time, I mean, two huge amusement parks. The only way you get there is walk, carriage, bicycle, the easy way, hop on a trolley, a dime, you get in, and these two were very popular places. The Utica Park, where later Chicago Nomadic was built, um, had uh, restaurants, a roller coaster, merry-go-round, baseball diamond, a zoo, a big flower garden. Um, uh, there was no, no water there, there was no pond. Summit Park, as you know, did have a, a, a pond. Riskany Creek. It was on a Riskany Creek, yeah. yeah. And the same thing, uh, I mean, you're talking, especially Summit Park, some occasion you get 15, 20,000 people. I mean, Utica Park was very, 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 very busy too. Um, and uh, the, the, base, the baseball diamond at, um, um, uh, at the Utica Park Babe Ruth one time, I believe it was in the late 20s, I'm not sure about the date, I played a hit a home run. <laughs> it was that with the, he had a team that he'd traveled with. Yeah, was there that were barnstormers yeah. in those days, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, uh, after the season ended, they would, uh, they would play uh, to earn money, uh, yeah. other than Babe Ruth, that they didn't make that much money. Uh, was there a, a horse racing part of Utica Park? Yeah. Um, one of the reasons the trolley company decided to build the, the Utica Park, uh, Utica had a driving park uh, that was where the Masonic home is today. And you had harness racing, very popular, drew from all over the, uh, the Northeast. Uh, when the Masonic home decided to build there, the driving park went. So both Summit Park and the Utica Park had, um, I don't know, quarter mile hard, uh, racing tracks um, that, um, again, you know, uh, uh, drew the racing crowd, you know, very yeah. popular. The, uh, uh, the one in uh, uh, Riskany, uh, Summit Park, that had a, I don't remember the original Summit Park, of course, but they had a reincarnation. They brought that park back in it later closed, years. It closed, the, the two parks, by the 1920s, Automobiles were becoming more popular. 
the state was paving roads. So now you could drive to Sylvan Beach, you could drive to Old Forge, you could drive to New England. And it really hurt the two, the two, uh, the, the, the two parks. So in the 19, late 1920s, Summit Park closed. The Utica Park closed in the early 30s. Uh, but uh, later in the late 30s, um, Summit Park opened again. It didn't have the merry-go-round, but, but in the 50s, while I was going to Utica College, and, uh, after, uh, I was working at Daw Drug part-time. Yeah, now so, Rite Aid, right? Yeah, so this was 1958, 59. And I remember we had a company picnic at Summit Park. 19, we, yeah, I drove up there, and they had a couple of pavilions and picnic benches and fireplaces. The swimming pool was closed. I couldn't, there wasn't a pond or anything, so there was none of that activity. It was really just for barbecues and company picnics. But then after a couple of years, that closed too. Yeah. The uh, uh, Loom de Boom era, Frank, name some of the companies that came in here during that time. Well, um, again, you know, uh, I, after, um, um, really the first one that before Chicago and Amatic was a smaller one, GE Tube Factory on Kent Street across from Chancellor Park. And um, what kind of factory was that? Tube, uh, tubes. Oh, tubes. Tubes. Yeah. Vacuum tubes. Tube. Yeah. 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 But it was, I, I think they had about 400 people. But that group, the Loom the Boom group. group That's where uh, Central Association for the Blind is. Exactly. Today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and then con they brought in Continental Can on Seward Ave, uh, which later became Bendix Aviation. But they brought in. Um, so those are the first two. The big one was in Chicago Nomadic. They brought in. But then they got, they brought, uh, I think Bendix Aviation came, then GE, um, radio receiver on Bleecker Street. I know, you, didn't one of your family members work there? It, no, I'm thinking no, of somebody else. No, yeah. But that uh, uh, the radio receiver on, uh, that would be the corner of uh, Culver and uh, Bleecker. Right, yeah. uh, more transistor radios were made in Utica, New York than anywhere in the world? Oh, yeah. I, I, if I, I, I'm almost, I think I'm correct here. It was the last American company to build transistor railroad, uh, rail, uh, yeah. radios. We come back. We got some more to talk about with yeah. Frank Tomeno. Short break. Right back. And welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. Frank Tomano is our guest. He is in his eighth decade. That's hard to believe, Frank. Eighth decade at the Observer Dispatch. He has uh, done it all down there. Sports reporter, stringer, uh, city desk, uh, columnist. We're talking loom to boom, a great era in Utica's history. Uh, Frank, you mentioned uh, GE. And GE really, this was a GE town at one time. You had radio receiver over on uh, Culver and Bleecker, all those transistor, because we're talking about transistor radios that are like that. You had to have a little handle to carry them around. I had one. Um, but then you had uh, the military side, and they were up on French Road. They were on uh, Broad Street. Street. Boy, yeah. they really yeah, employed you know, you had thousands. You thousands working around. Yeah. You know, they were doing uh, mostly work for the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. You know, but they de they were also developed like the radars and I remember I was talking with Bill Shinatri one time. Bill Sh the late Bill Shinatri worked at GE and he told me some of the things that they developed there. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're still being used. Who knows? Yeah. It's a uh, and, and from what I understand, I knew quite. And I still do know quite a few people who work there. 
they liked the company. I guess it was a nice company to work for. Yeah, actually, I worked there for. Oh, you did! Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah, yeah. on the uh, they built down on Broad Street. What would it be? Nine oh. 901 broad something like that yeah. and um, they built uh, a radar system for the Air Force it was ter the F111 yeah. big project yeah. and they built that radar terrain following radar yeah. so the pilots did they could fly close to the ground yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. and the plane would just automatically yeah. Uh, yeah. well like I say they not only manufactured they developed yeah um, but they sent you, know, that was a good company. They sent you to school. They paid for your college if you I wanted to go. You, uh, Great you, benefits. You could go to Utica College, yeah. NBCC, and if you had to get a, maintain a certain grade, yeah. they would pay the tuition. They encouraged their workers to get involved in politics, yeah. which is unusual, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so it was a you mentioned earlier that uh, if he isn't your favorite, he is one of your favorites, uh, Mayor Boyd Golder. Why? Uh, why have you held him know. in I, such I high just, esteem? I just think Boyd Golder, first of all, he was a tough guy. Didn't take any baloney. He was a big guy, wasn't he, Frank? Well, not that no. really big. He, he was an ex-wrestler. Yeah. He used to wrestle in these county fairs when he was a kid. Uh, I was, I'm guessing now, probably about six feet, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I said, at his, when, he was, when he turned 85, they were going to give him a big party or something. And I called him. I was writing Frankly Speaking. And I said, uh, I'd like to you know, interview him. Tell me when. So he came down the OD three afternoons. I spent the whole afternoon with him. And uh, I, I, he, again, he, he told me just great yeah. stories. And um, one of the things that he always, he said, we've got to re-educate this workforce. We can't, it, we, we're not going to be able to attract companies. If, so they were instrumental in getting Utica College here, Mohawk, what is now Mohawk Valley Community College here. He came in 46, and it was people like Boyd Golder. In fact, if you go to Utica College today, one of the buildings, there's a huge portrait of Boyd Golder, because he wasn't alone, of course, but he and others, um, uh, he told me the story where uh, at that time, Father Joseph May was head of Catholic Charities. He later became pastor of St. Agnes Church and Our Lady of Lourdes. A little guy, about 5'3". And uh, at that time, the Syracuse Diocese was interested in Catholics throughout the diocese contributing to building Le Moyne College in Syracuse. Um, Monsignor, he, was a, he wasn't a Monsignor at the time. Monsignor May, Utica needs a college. Mm. It's great, Le Moyne's a great college, great. We need a college here. And he and Boyd Golden and others went to see the Chancellor of Syracuse University, and they said, this Monsignor Ray pounding on the table. We need a college. We're losing too many of our young people. And Boyd Golden was ahead of that, and they, they were successful. Syracuse came into Utica and started Utica College in 1946. And uh, MVCC was important because it was retraining some of these mill workers, how to use a drill press, how to, how to be able to work as Chicago Nomadic. Um, and, um, they didn't start off as MVCC, though. They started no, off the, at was, uh, Mohawk was, Valley Technical Institute well, was one was the name. New York, the, New York, uh, the New York Institute of something or other. Yeah. And then it became Mohawk Valley Technical Institute and then MV, Mohawk Valley Community We've College. only got a couple of minutes left, yeah. but I want to uh, just touch on this. Um, big uh, renovation going on up at uh, the Ovalson Apartments. Mm. They fell into quite disrepair over the years. But at one time, Frank, that, those were luxury apartments, were they not? Oh, at one time, yeah. Uh, in fact, um, I'm surprised. I, I've come across an old article. On the seventh floor was a big restaurant very popular, attracted the elite from Utica. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, they were plush apartments at the, at, you know, when it first started. Yeah, yeah. and then across the street you had the Canatina. Canatina. The Canatina was never as plush as the uh, Ovalston, but that was, yeah, those, those were, and, you know, boy, that's a big, well, the Canatina's gone, but Ovalston, what a huge building. We've got one minute left. What yeah. are you working on for your next uh, column? Well, I always do my, you know, I always read my 
read the old new newspapers. I'm thinking for whatever happened to, they want me to write a column now, whatever happened to once a month. And I've written about, well, Chicago Dramatic was my last one. And I'm thinking about uh, the old Howard Johnsons in North Utica. Oh, I remember, yeah. Remember Howard Johnson? I do, yeah. And because I come across a small article the other day in the New York Post that the last Howard Johnson closed. Oh, okay. The restaurant. It was in North Utica on the, uh, that would be the east side of Genesee Street, right? East side, almost across from what was old McConnell Field, but I don't know what's there now, the Red Roof Inn or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. Very popular place, yeah. Yep, I was there many times. Thanks for coming in, yep. appreciate it. Yep. That's gonna do it for us this week, but we'll be back next week. We'll do it all again. CNYHomePage.com, lots of good stuff there. Until next time, take care of yourself, everybody. <laughs>